Hi, this is Andrew Bishko of Napasha Music, and you're listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You are in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical You, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing one of our own team members here at Musical You. Andrew Bishko is our content editor and product manager at Musical You, which means he's in charge of overseeing everything we publish and also the teaching material we continue to expand and improve inside Musical You itself. But as you're about to discover, despite his huge contributions at Musical You, this represents just one small part of a long and fascinating career as a musician, composer, author, and music educator. Andrew has performed and toured professionally in a number of bands, taught private instrument lessons, published a book, and taught university courses in the US. He's played a wide variety of instruments from piano to accordion to flute and Native American flute to a recent new edition, the Guitaron. He's played in styles as varied as classical, folk, reggae, jazz, klezmer, and even a Pink Floyd tribute band. In this conversation, you'll discover how he went from classical Chopin recitals on piano to touring the world playing flute in a reggae band, the one genre of music that resonated most deeply with him emotionally and caused him to focus on exclusively that for 15 years, and why the best way to learn to improvise might involve being taught how to go sit on a rock. This interview runs long. And that was even with me being very self-controlled and not diving into any one of several topics along the way that I would have loved to pick Andrew's brains about further. After 90 minutes, I felt like we had barely scratched the surface, and there are a ton of interesting and useful insights packed into this conversation for you. I think you'll see why we consider it an honor and a privilege to have Andrew on the Musical U team. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical U. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to be here, Christopher. I am in awe of the musical journey you've had, and I am really looking forward to digging into it with you. You play such a variety of instruments and genres. I'm sure you often hear from people, gosh, you must just play anything and everything. You were born gifted. Was that the case? Did you grow (laughs) up finding that music came easy to you and you could kind of play anything you wanted to? Absolutely not. Um, music was difficult for me. Uh, when I first wanted to play music, um, I wanted to play the guitar, of course, and be like the Beatles. But uh, my mother translated that as piano. I don't know how that worked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> magical but, uh, adult so, translation. <laughs> yes. So uh, I think, uh, um, well, I started my piano lessons and it was the the very traditional John Thompson uh, books and uh, learning with the notes on the page. Uh, I always found it to be difficult, but I did work at it. Um, at the same time, we had a um, we had a beautiful piano in our home growing up, a baby grand piano, and uh, I would we'd love to sit down and. Uh, improvise on the piano and uh, me, myself and my sisters and one to my parents uh, so one thing that they did that was great is that when uh, they, they never told us to stop banging on the piano I remember making lots and lots of noise <laughs> and never being disciplined uh, or being told not to play the piano I don't know if it's true or not but <laughs> I don't remember it maybe mm-hmm. I didn't hear them <laughs> <laughs> Um, And so I had the opportunity to explore, you know, we would climb around inside the piano and play the strings in there and open the pedals and we'd have one person on top and we would make all kinds of things to explore that instrument. And I think that was uh, a freedom that they allowed us uh, that uh, was really beneficial. Terrific. And were you taking lessons as well as banging around and improvising? Yes, I was taking uh, piano lessons uh, and uh, just going through the the whole method book thing. Uh, And 
I, I didn't know why it was so hard for me, but I kept working on it. And I, I did become pretty good at the piano in the sense that I could play. I learned to play songs that were, uh, you know, I, I was playing some nice Chopin pieces. Chopin was my favorite. Um, my parents had a nice uh, music library with a lot of classical music. And uh, so I learned to play some of those pieces uh, by the time I was in high school. Um, I did my recitals, but it was this kind of a thing where I'd spend all year learning my recital piece and then I'd play it for my recital uh, and then I'd forget it the day after <laughs> and start the next year. You know, it was just, um, it was basically kind of like, um, uh, learning tricks rather than, uh, rather, and, and I, and not that I didn't get into it because I really got into the, the music actually very deeply, you know, emotionally I would get into it. But as far as facility in terms of playing and sight reading and being able to, uh, do it easily. It was always uh, it was always a real uphill battle. Interesting. And was it very much all classical music in your household, or what were you surrounded by musically? Well, we listened to all kinds of music, uh, and uh, mostly. I mean, my parents had mostly classical, but they also had uh, folk music and some music from different places. Like we had this box set of flamenco music that I remember very well uh, that we listened to a lot. Um, my father would wake us up in the morning playing uh, Sousa marches at, at uh, full <laughs> volume. <laughs> and uh, you know, so we had, uh, and we had musicals. Uh, being in a Jewish family, there was fiddle around the roof, but we also had uh, uh, Sound of Music and other musicals uh, on LPs. Uh, and then my father, when he was young, when he was in his teens, he had been a DJ for a, a short time, a party DJ. And one day we, we pulled all the, um, we pulled all the 78s that he had from that era. Uh, this was the early fifties out of the attic. So a lot of Andrews sisters, that was our favorite Perry Como and that kind of a thing. And, uh, we had this great thing called a cassette recorder in our stereo. And we thought, <laughs> Oh, now that we have cassettes, we could just record all these 78s on the cassettes and then get rid of them, right? <laughs> so it was pretty tragic that those are gone, but um, we listened to, we wound up listening to a lot of that music as well. Very um, cool. Other things, other things that we listened to um, uh, that really uh, pop out in my mind was uh, uh, Switched On Bach, which was uh, uh, Bach played on a Moog synthesizer. It was a, uh, early synthesizer thing, uh, that really uh, tickled out my imagination. And, uh, then when, as my, me and my sisters grew older, we brought in our own records like, uh, Beatles and fifth dimension. And, uh, my sister was into, uh, yes. And, and, uh, King Crimson and prog rock. So she got into that stuff. And, um, and then, um, uh, I was playing the flute and we can back up a little bit on that, but, uh, so I got Jethro Tull albums. Um, now I, I really couldn't stand rock and roll when I was growing up, but I tolerated Jethro Tull because he played the flute. <laughs> but, um, so I, that was my intro to rock and roll actually it was my sister's prog rock stuff. And, uh, and then my, um, Jethro Tull. I see. So that sounds like a, a really rich musical environment, in fact. And yes. so how did you branch out from classical piano to uh, flute you mentioned there? Well, um, in fourth grade, uh, we started school orchestra and I wanted to play the bass. And I wanted to stand up and go, dum, 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 dum. <laughs> and uh, uh, they didn't have one. So I thought, well, cello's next biggest thing. You know, I just think I wanted to play the biggest thing I could get my hands on. And, uh, uh, my piano teacher and my mother had decided that I was going to play the flute. Uh, and that was not my idea because flute was, uh, considered the girl's instrument. There were no boys that played flute. And, um, I did not want to do that when I was in fourth grade. Uh, but, uh, you know, finally my mom said, I'm not driving you to school with a cello. You are going to play the flute. And, um, I do think there was angelic guidance there as well, because I had a lot of respiratory problems, uh, growing up. And, uh, 
playing the flute really helped me quite a bit with that. It turned out to be such a wonderful uh, instrument for me. It, um, it was difficult for me to work on the tone uh, at first, but I, I was diligent with it. And the whole concept of the flute, just playing one note at a time, as opposed to piano, where I had to figure out how all these notes fit together without any real understanding of harmony. Um, but playing a melody instrument uh, was wonderful for me. Uh, and I, I really took to it. Um, that also helped me tremendously in branching out my musical exposure because of this idea of the flute being the girl's instrument. And, you know, I had to settle in and play it. Um, I'm going to back up and tell a little story about when I first was learning. Uh, I couldn't make a sound on the instrument. And I was just, you know, I would try and fail and try and fail. And, um, you know, my, my dad just said, you're going to your room and you can't come out till you make a sound. <laughs> and I went up there and I, I think I cried for a half an hour and then I picked it up and boom, there it was. <laughs> there was the sound. So, uh, there was something like that I, I guess, uh, in modern day, we refer to that as high stakes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. um, so there was some high stakes going on there and it really uh, moved me into it. So anyway, because I, wanted, I, I didn't want to play the girl's instrument, I didn't want to make the flute cool. I started to look into, okay, what are some other flute? First of all, who are the guy flute players? Um, and remember, this is way before anything like an internet. Uh, so I had the public library, which I hung out at a lot, and uh, there was a record section, and I discovered Jean-Pierre Rampal, and I got out all his albums and listened to him. Uh, and he had, I really liked his tone, because he has this, like, sort of really deep, dark, but kind of husky sound, um, and uh, it was, I, I really enjoyed it. And then um, there was... Uh, then I started to look at these different flutes from different places in the world. Uh, so I uh, found this, this record of African flute music and uh, um, some Eastern European flute music. And uh, at one point, <clears throat> I, I uh, watched the movie Barry Lyndon. I think this is early 70s. Uh, and it takes place in Ireland. And they had the soundtrack was by the Chieftains, which is the Irish uh, band. And I fell in love with Irish music, uh, bought myself a tin whistle, taught myself a couple of songs. Uh, here, um, play this on the flute. This was the first Irish song I looked at, learned. It was hard for me to figure out the fast ones. And I was figuring things out by ear, too. So this was like getting, thing, getting the idea of playing by ear uh, because I couldn't find any music for any of this stuff. So uh, this, I learned this Irish song, The, the Women of Ireland by Sean O'Reilly. The flute was really your gateway to exploring all different styles of music by the sounds of it. Yes, it was. And um, uh, it, it really broke me out of my, out of the, it broke me out in terms of getting out into the music of the world. Uh, it also uh, created a, 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 this sort of insatiable hunger so whenever I heard something, it's like, oh, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to focus on. And so I would just jump around quite a bit. And it's also my great way to uh, really playing by ear. Like I, I it's described earlier, uh, I really loved to improvise on the piano, but I had no clue what was going to happen when I started playing something. It was more like a 
what we call at Musical U, the listen, the, the play listen approach where you play something. It's like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. Um, but with the flute, I really started to figure things out by ear. Um, and part of that was uh, the stimulus there was that I wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't able to sing. Uh, I, when I was young, uh, I had nodes on my vocal cords. And if I would open my mouth to sing, I would literally lose my voice and be like, I couldn't talk anymore. And <laughs> so it, it was like not a choice almost. Um, and so uh, I had, uh, when I got into high school and I was playing the flute, I had friends that had uh, like uh, in my uh, temple youth group, there were these two guys, uh, Dave and Dave, who were the song leaders. And they played all these beautiful songs on their guitars and sang. And I wanted to, you know, sing along, but I couldn't. So I just picked up the flute and I'd start to play by ear or to improvise. Uh, and uh, so because of that constraint of not being able to sing, it pushed me into uh, really exploring more things that I could do on the flute with improvisation and playing by ear. That's really fascinating because, you know, we often talk about how your, your singing voice is your first instrument and it's your, your natural instrument and that's why <laughs> you should make friends with it. But when that's taken away from you, I can totally imagine how that would make you kind of bond with the flute or, you know, whatever melody instrument you picked up as a way to replicate what you heard and loved and, and give you that way into exploring music. It's, it, yes, it is um, kind of... You know, when I look back at my life, I always th look at things. It seems like I'm always coming through the back door into something. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's, an, that's another example of that coming through the back door. I'm sure we'll find more as we go on. Um, and later on, when I did, um, it, you know, it, it, it definitely was revealed to me that my ears weren't as good as I thought they were. <laughs> because I had gone it from the instrument first, but it got me playing on my instrument. Uh, and when I started to get in touch with my singing later on, uh, I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, I really wasn't hearing. <laughs> I was really having a difficult time hearing things. Um, when I did ear training. Gosh, well, that's definitely something I would like to unpack when, when the moment comes, because mm. uh, I think a All lot right. of people would assume that if you were playing by ear on flute, you must have had a really good ear. Um, so let's definitely pick that apart in a moment. Mm -hmm. First, though, I don't want to skip ahead. You were playing piano through high school and flute from the fourth grade. Did you go on to do music at university? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I quit piano lessons sometime during high school, and I did stay in flute. We had a great orchestra and band program at my school, and it was a lot of fun, um, a lot of friends in it. But um, I wasn't... Uh, I, uh, I had, uh, I, I didn't think of it as being a career and it seemed like I should do something more substantial with my life. And I really didn't know what to do. I mean, basically I was, I was pretty good at school. You know, my, my one sister was a violinist. My other sister was an artist. And I always would say, Oh, my talent is going to school because I just would go to school and I'd get good grades. And so, um, uh, think like, what do people who are good at school do? And, uh, I thought, well, uh, I could, and then I had a friend, it was actually a girl I had a crush on and she was going to med school. I said, okay, so I'll be a doctor. I'll go to med, <laughs> pre-med. And, uh, so I went to, actually, I, she went to the one, she went to Northwestern and, um, I said, uh, and, and she was there. And so that was the only school I applied to, you know, I said, I'm going there because she was there. <laughs> and then I got there. I never saw her once I got there. And, um, within a couple of weeks, I discovered humanities classes, uh, and just fell in love with them. And, uh, and I had a crush on my English teacher. So that kind of pushed me in that direction. <laughs> and, uh, so I did my undergraduate. I did, um, I started out as, uh, uh, doing, uh, English literature and, uh, I was in a poetry writing program for a while. Again, that was a following a crush cause I had a crush on the teacher, but, um, I had never written a poem before, <laughs> but, uh, that actually turned out to be, I mean, uh, it's relates to music because that was the hardest class I ever took in my whole life. And the only class I think in my whole life that I got a C in 
uh, and it's the class I learned the most at because we picked about po- we picked out poems. It wasn't like this this airy fairy. Oh, I'm going to write poetry class. It was like a um, you know you are going to write a couplet in the style of of Byron, and it's going to just like be just like he wrote that. And now you're going to write something in the style of Shakespeare. It's going to be just like him. Him, and you're going to. We had this thing where we had to imitate all these different poets, and it required a deep analysis of each one of them and how they use language and how they use rhythm and how they use sounds. And it got me really thinking analytically on a very detailed level about how each detail <coughs> in a work of art contributes to the whole. And it really affected my whole vision of life, of looking at life and looking at things in a very detailed way. And then looking at those parts and how each one of those parts related to the whole. Um, and, uh, so that was my, and then basically after that class to the rest of my, uh, undergraduate, um, uh, I went from there into a humanities program and, uh, through all of that, I used those tools and I still use those tools today that I learned in that class. Um, and when I came back to music, it, uh, I used them as well. Uh, so after undergraduate, I, I had studied Italian when I was in, in, in college and uh, had this idea that I wanted to go to Italy. I was really fed up with the whole, um, I mean, I had be, been on a track, if I would have followed the sort of career track, I would have gone on to be an academic. Uh, but um, I, I was, um, I, I didn't like the whole world. There was a, the hypocrisy that was in the academic world, the supposed freedom that people had, but very, uh, very rigidly controlled intellectual guidelines that people were under. Um, uh, and I remember when I graduated, there was, uh, of all the full professors there, there was one on the stage with all their regalia. There was one black and there was one woman and they were the same person. So, <laughs> It was just very, you know, uh, that world at that time was very restrictive. So I, um, anyway, I had this idea I wanted to just go to Italy, and I found a way to do that um, working at a, 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 a camp, a YMCA camp. And uh, then I kind of hung around. I really didn't want to go home because I loved it over there. I loved the culture. It really loosened me up. I was... Uh, you know, like not so uptight and, um, and, uh, I was enjoying myself a lot. Uh, and I was running out of money, uh, and I saw people playing music out on the streets and I still had my flute that I carried around, um, uh, even though I didn't play it very well anymore. Uh, but I saw people playing out in the streets. I said, well, you know, I could do that. I could sit on a corner and play some music and, and then, you know, you play out there and you get a little, uh, dime or a nickel or something like that as you're playing. And, it's like, okay, I'm going to practice until I get my next coin. I'm going to play until I get my next thing. And so it was really inspiring to practice. And it was a big moment for me because I realized, I mean, of course, the more I was out there, the more I played, the more I got into it. And I was doing everything by ear and everything improvised. So uh, it stimulated me to really get into that. And it, the other big revelation there was as, as long as I could play music, I could eat. <laughs> And, uh, and so I realized that I could, you know, support myself. Of course, I wasn't, there wasn't much to support at that time. It was just one little person sleeping under a bush, you know, <laughs> but, uh, um, and it was a lot of fun. And I really got into, um, I met people playing as I traveled around. I, I, I really, uh, improved my, uh, improvisation and playing by ear, uh, by doing that. And I did that for, a couple of years. And what style of music were you playing when you were improvising or playing by ear? I was, at first I was playing a lot of jazz. Um, and, uh, you know, that just stuff that I had heard growing up and, and that was in my, in my ears, um, blues. Uh, and then, uh, I had, I met this one guy who was, uh, playing reggae and ska. He played the acoustic bass and we started jamming together I discovered reggae when I was much younger, uh, but I never tried to play it before. And uh, we just had a great time playing 
playing that kind of music. And I, uh, I really felt that that's what I wanted to get into uh, deep, more deeply. And so after a, a couple of years on the streets of Italy, what was the next step for you? Where did you take things from there? Well, um, you know, I came home for my sister's wedding and then I, uh, I had this idea that, uh, that I was going to continue that kind of work. <laughs> and I was staying with my mom. My parents were split up and I stayed with my mom and she was like, no, you're not, that's not going to work out here. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> I went to stay with my dad and I was a, pretty much thoroughly obnoxious. Uh, I think, um, I just, I really wanted to play music. I really wanted to do that. But, um, uh, there, that was in Cleveland, Ohio. And there was a, this is back in the eighties. There was a big reggae scene there and I could go dancing, you know, two or three nights a week. Uh, and I loved to dance and I loved, uh, reggae. And, uh, I kept on talking to people. I want to be in the band. I want to, I want to play in a band. And, uh, there were some, uh, members from two of the top bands that were reforming a new band. Uh, and, uh, um, there was this guy, it was a flute player that they wanted to be in the band, but he wasn't able to do it. He had a full-time job. He was from Guyana. He's, he was about, you know, 15 feet tall. His name was Jojo and Jojo said he, he, he turned me out of these guys and that's how I got into uh, the reggae band. I see. And your reggae and flute aren't a combination you often hear about or would often notice in reggae recordings. How did that work? Uh, it was great. I mean, I had, uh, you know, I brought my own thing to the band and it gave us a sound that was, uh, that was unique. Um, and, uh, I, uh, I had a really good feeling for Caribbean music at the same time in the time period I was sitting in with a lot of Latin bands and, uh, playing son and rumba and, 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 and mambo and stuff like that. And so it was, uh, it was, a kind of a Caribbean thing that worked, um, during my time at the band to add more versatility, that's when I, I picked up saxophone. Uh, and of course that's more reggae ish. <laughs> and, um, I also, uh, started playing some keyboard stuff in the band and, uh, from my, uh, limited piano recollections and, uh, and percussion and, you know, just dancing around and having a good time. Nice. And uh, what were the other members of the band playing? And, uh, you know, tell us a bit more about the band. Well, uh, the lead player, uh, the, the lead singer and the leader of the band uh, was the bass player, um, you know, and playing reggae bass and singing at the same time is really quite a trick because it's very polyrhythmic. And uh, he was playing and he's playing fretless on top of that. So he was quite a talented guy and beautiful voice and uh, just a really big guy with big dreads and, um, he was very charismatic. And, uh, then we had a, a drummer that was, uh, a you know, skinny white guy just with super energy and, um, and just, uh, explosive <laughs> kind of energetic person. We had a, a great guitar player, um, and then key, some other people that came and went in, uh, in the, in the group percussionists and keyboard players, but, um, it was a very dynamic band. It was really mixed. There was uh, uh, racially mixed and socioeconomically mixed. I mean, there were guys that were from the ghetto. There was guys from the suburbs. Um, there, there was, uh, and uh, it was, it was just there was uh, men. There was women came through there. So it was a, a very creative and dynamic mix of people. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it sounds like the exact opposite of that university platform you mentioned in terms of uh, diversity. Yes, very diverse, very creative, and everybody came to the table with 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 uh, either with an extreme amount of creativity in their playing, or uh, or in their writing, uh, songwriting. Um, so uh, we had it, it was really fun in that way too. Great, and were you mostly performing around Cleveland? Uh, we actually um, toured all the time. Uh, I mean, from the time I joined the band, you know, after uh, a few months of rehearsal, 
uh, I never stayed in one place for uh, more than two weeks. Um, we we covered every place in, in the United States from Colorado uh, to um, Boston and down to Florida, you know, Florida Keys, and uh, constantly on the move. Um, and then uh, we somehow hooked up with the Department of Defense of the United States and started doing tours uh, uh, to military bases. And that was a huge eye opener for me culturally um, and uh, really taught me to the, the value of the people, the service of the pe- that people were doing uh, overseas. I'd never understood it before, um, but we went to uh, Iceland and uh, Germany and the Azores. And then we did a tour and went to Korea, uh, went to Japan. We, they flew us out to Iwo Jima. I played reggae on Iwo Jima, which just, uh, just blows my mind. That's <laughs> uh, a site of a great World War II battle, just a tiny little island out in the Pacific and Guam. And, you know, with the military, the places that you go that tourists don't normally get to. And so I saw, play, I saw things and places and, and I was already a veteran traveler from my time in Italy. So whenever we'd, we'd hit the ground, I was off running. You know, I'd be out there exploring uh, everything. And uh, I just and, and, and I was looking to what the music of that particular country was like. Uh, I, I was particularly drawn to Korea for some reason. I just absolutely felt like I was home when I was in Korea, which is really weird because I didn't have, <laughs> have any resemblance to anybody, but I, uh, uh, there, but, uh, I, I just love being there and love the music and the people and the food. <laughs> mm. And any musical highlights for you during that period of travel and touring? Well, musically, um, the, the, the big thing there that, that stimulated my growth, uh, apart from just playing and learning all these songs and, you know, we did doing everything by ear, uh, was, uh, I started writing songs. And I was I was really into um, uh, the Paul Simon Graceland album. I listened to that over and over again, and uh, wanted to bring a more Afro pop uh, sound to our band. Uh, and I would write songs, and I would hear them in my head, but it was very difficult for me to communicate because I really didn't understand chords. I really didn't understand. Uh, um, I, you know, my singing, I would try and sing the melodies to people and, uh, they were very patient with me and we turned out with some really great collaborations, but it was very frustrating that I couldn't just say, Hey, play this note, play these chords. Um, and so by the time, uh, the end of that whole, uh, chapter in my life came, I was very strongly motivated to, uh, really have a musical education. I see. Interesting. You know, sometimes when I'm talking to people about what we do at Musical U, I'll say something about how even professional musicians often feel like their ears aren't up to scratch. And people are often skeptical of that. You know, they assume that if you're touring the world with a band, you must have an amazing ear. And of course you understand chords. So it's reassuring to hear that you were, um, you were definitely one of those who found there was maybe something missing, even though you were having great success in one dimension of music. Absolutely. Um, and, and yeah, it's, I mean, the truth is, is that there's always something missing. I don't think I feel any more. Um, I mean, I, I, I can see and appreciate a lot of the, the tools I've gathered, but I, I always, I, I never feel like I'm, I really got it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's I never one of have. the wonderful things about music, I think, is that learning music can be just as endless and varied as music itself. You know, there, there's no end to it. So you found yourself craving some maybe more formal or traditional or theoretical music education. Um, before we talk about your time at the conservatory where you went on to, I think there was one other pivotal moment that came along the way during your time with that reggae band Sata. Um, I believe the scene was in Logan, Utah. Could you tell us about that? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, that's so true. Uh, yes. Um, I was in Logan, Utah, and we were playing a gig, and it was, you know, we usually played pretty late. I think it was about three or four in the morning at the, when we were done playing. 
And this man comes up to me. Um, he's got furs on. He's got a huge beard, long hair. And he introduces himself to me, says, my name is Crazy Coyote. I'm a mountain man. And we start talking. He says, I have something to show you. And, uh, you know, I was always up for adventure. And so I said, well, let's go. And so we, we went through the streets of town and we came to this one house. And uh, he said, be really quiet. We can't turn the lights on. And we're walking through this house and there's people sleeping all over the floor. We're stepping over these people. And uh, we come to this little back room. And there was a street light outside sort of shining in, but you couldn't really see very much. And he hands me this, um, what looked like a broken stick. And he says, go ahead and blow in the pointy end. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I start playing this thing and it was a native American flute. Uh, and I mean, this instrument just jumped in my hands. You could just feel the vibrations of it. You know, it was almost like, almost like, weightless. Uh, uh, and you could feel the vibrations through your fingers as you were playing. Uh, and it was actually, uh, it was broken at the end. He said that that was the Hayoka, which in um, the uh, Lakota uh, philosophy is like when you make something, uh, you never finish it or you break off a little piece to uh, kind of like a thing, like anything in the physical is not quite perfect. Um, uh, and Anyway, I, I happen to have a flute right here, Native American flute. I'll play a little bit for you. Quite a departure from reggae. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of that whole vibey kind of hippie thing, I guess. Mm. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, uh, I, I, and, and so I had from that time period, from that time, that experience, I always had it in my mind uh, that someday I was going to have one of these flutes. And I started listening to people like Carlos Nakai and other uh, flute players along with the other things I was listening to. Terrific. And for the listeners who've just heard you play that and thought to themselves, yeah, that, that sounds like it would be a Native American flute. <laughs> Apart from the timbre of the instrument, what would there be that characterizes what you just played for us that would make it sound that way? Well, um, what I played was uh, improvised. And uh, I mean, there are traditional Native American melodies, of course, that you can play on the flute. But this the, in my mind, the, um, the Native American flute, uh, the tradition is that it was a courting instrument. It was a very personal instrument. It was something that when you were in love with somebody, uh, you'd go out into the woods, you'd find a stick, measure it by the length of your arm, you would uh, carve it out, you would put the holes where your fingers lay so the scale would be biologically according to your, the shape of your body. And you would be playing the most sincere music from the depths of your heart um, as you uh, expressed yourself to the person that you loved. Uh, so uh, as opposed to many other exp cultural expressions in Native American culture, the Native American flute is one of intense personal uh, expression. So to me, improvisation is the foundation of that. Um, and I think that that's one reason why, um, you know, where it's coming from when I play it. Uh, there are also natural things in terms of the scale, the way the instrument's constructed. Uh, the, the, you can play a full chromatic scale on it, but uh, the, the natural um, construction of the instrument lends itself to the minor pentatonic scale. 
I see. Fascinating. Well, for anyone who's curious to know more, I should mention Andrew has in fact written a book on Native American flute, going into great detail and helping you learn to play it. Um, was that the end of your Native American flute journey, or how did you come to write a book later on? Well, uh, no. Um, so fast forward. Uh, when I uh, I left the reggae band, uh, is because I had met. Uh, a woman who was to become my first wife in Alaska. We were touring. We, we, we toured and we were in Alaska for a time. And, uh, uh, I wound up, uh, moving there after, uh, leaving the band and then in between going to the conservatory. Um, and, uh, one day I was, uh, I was out, I was clearing brush in the back of my house so we could have better view of our mountains and I had a big bonfire going. Uh, and, uh, this guy called me up. He was somebody that I had knew that I knew, uh, but, uh, I didn't know that this was his thing. And, uh, he said he had a gift for me. And I said, Oh, well, you know, yeah, I always, always like presents. So <laughs> <laughs> come on over. I've got a bonfire going, we can hang out. And, uh, so he came out and he, he handed me this, uh, this bag, uh, with a, um, I, and I pulled it out and there was a native American flute. Then we started playing out there, uh, by the fire. Uh, and I mean, I really didn't know how to play it, but I knew enough, uh, about flutes that I could, I could make music with it. And it was really bizarre. I mean, we, we were out there and, um, the birds came and sat on the branches, just like in a Disney movie. And they were twittering away. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just almost creepy, but in a good way. And, uh, and uh, we played out by the fire and I just fell in love with it. And, um, I decided, you know, I had a lot of formal training by then, uh, and that I was going to take a different approach. I was rather than, uh, learning how to play the flute, I was going to let the flute teach me. And, uh, you know, so another constraint I put on myself is I said, I'm just going to only play this instrument out, outside. I'm never going to play it indoors you know, at that time. And so for a time I would just go on my back deck and I would listen to nature and I would try and imitate the sounds. Uh, and I would, um, and it just a completely improvisational approach and exploratory approach to the instrument. Um, it's how I really got into playing it. I was wanting to show you some nature sounds. I'm looking for the right one. This is the, the first flute that I received the, as a gift. And, uh, so, okay. So, there's a few little bird calls and nature sounds in there. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Quite, uh, quite a difference with your classical piano upbringing and your world yes. touring reggae band to, to decide that you would let the instrument teach you and get so, so far from those formal and, um, well-structured worlds is really interesting. Uh, you mentioned that yes. this was happening in parallel or during your time at the conservatory. Is that right? I think this, this is afterwards. Um, and, uh, I, you asked me about the, the book, um, so just follow through on that, that stream. Um, I, I started teaching people play to play native American flute as well. And I was involved in flute circles, uh, which is a, a thing where people get together and, and, uh, they, uh, oftentimes native American flute seems to be very transformative in people's lives because it's a very, um, easy instrument to play. And the sounds are beautiful right from the beginning. Of course, you can take it as far as you want, but, um, uh, we'd gather together and people would talk about these inspiring stories about the changes they had made in their lives as a result of their contact with the flute. And then they play their songs. Uh, and we'd go around these circles. And then I started teaching, uh, lessons, uh, with my, uh, teaching my own approach to the instrument in terms of improvisation. Uh, and I formulated this whole, um, this whole, uh, way of looking at it. Uh, so, uh, it came to a point in time where I wanted to put it down on, on paper, uh, and, uh, it turned out to be, I mean, I thought I had it all pretty squared away in my head, but the, the, uh, the journey of writing the book actually took 
a couple of years and uh, um, it was picked up by Mel Bay who uh, publishes it. And uh, it was, uh, I'm really proud of it. It had, uh, it, it's a, a totally improvisatory approach, but one in which you're developing your skills. Um, because a lot of times when people improvise, they, they kind of get, uh, when they first l- start wandering around, they get lost or bored. I mean, it's just like, okay, is that all there is? I mean, what can I do with it? And uh, so um, in the Native American flute community, there's this saying, if you really want to learn how to play the flute, I mean, you can get this book or that book or whatever, um, go out and sit on a rock, <laughs> which is what I did. Uh, but uh, what happens, a lot of people get frustrated or lost uh, after the brief um, flowering of their first explorations. And so I wrote a book. Uh, the name of my book is How to Sit on a Rock. <laughs> and uh, so there are lots of things to do um, to uh, bring the music from inside you, to uh, practice your techniques and scales in an improvisatory way, and to uh, get in touch with nature, uh, to really listen, listen deeply, and uh, allow that listening to become a part of your music. Uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that weave together um, and that went into that book. Fantastic. Well, that's definitely a big part of why I've been so happy to have you heading up our improv modules at Musical U, because as you say, improvisation can be a bit of a wilderness if you approach it in a creative and free way. But the other end of the spectrum is totally rigid and rule based and frustrating. And I think you have a, mm-hmm. a particular ability to blend those two worlds in a really productive and creative and satisfying way for students. Thank you. I, you know, a lot of that a lot of what's in our improvisation modules now is uh, came through that book. So we've mentioned a couple of times and kind of teased the listener. You did go on to study at the New England Conservatory. Could you tell us how that came to be and what that experience was like for you? Yes, uh, that's another good example of uh, coming in through the back door. Um, I I want to uh, I wanted to further my musical education. I wanted to be able to communicate with other people. That was the biggest thing. It was, uh, I wanted, you know, I had been so frustrated in the band trying to communicate with people. And I wanted to be able to say, you know, these are the chords, this is the music. And so um, we had toured quite a bit in Boston and I knew people from Berkeley and from the New England Conservatory. And so I went and I looked at both of those schools uh, and I was really attracted to the New England Conservatory, just a quirkier, older type of thing. And they had this program there called Third Stream Studies, which had been started by uh, Gunther Schuller. Uh, and it was uh, this idea, originally had been the idea of combining classical music and jazz at sort of uh, in-between worlds. Uh, and then it had branched out into this uh, idea of combining different styles and musical influences and, uh, and emerging with your own personal style. Uh, and the methodology was all based on ear training. Uh, and I was really attracted to this. Uh, it was a small department. Uh, and another thing that happened is when I was visiting there, I uh, visited a class being taught by Hank Snetsky on klezmer music, which is the Jewish folk music of Eastern Europe. And I mentioned earlier, I'd grown up Jewish, but in a very uh, uh, reform, kind of liberal congregation. Uh, and a lot of the old um, Eastern European trappings uh, that had, uh, of my uh, grandparents' culture, had been um, cleansed from that, <laughs> uh, that expression. And it hadn't been really satisfying to me uh, spiritually when I was growing up, so I'd moved on. Uh, But I went to this uh, class, and uh, Hankus was teaching this class, and he was, uh, the way he was moving around the room and the way he was talking and the music that was coming out, uh, I felt this very intense emotion, and it was not at all comfortable 
I mean, I wanted to laugh. I wanted to cry. I wanted to run out of the room, but I couldn't because I was on the opposite end of the room and I would knocked over all the instruments. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it was just, it was, it was not pleasant actually. Um, and I realized if there's some kind of music that has this kind of effect on me, I need to look into this. <laughs> I have to know what's going on here. And so, um, anyway, the, I, I, um, I was admitted to a master's program. They, I had to do some extra remedial work because I hadn't had an undergraduate musical education, uh, but I took some tests. I tested out of a lot of things and, um, and they said, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll let you in the master's program. Uh, and, uh, and then I came to this place and I, once I was there, I was like, what am I doing here? Because the musicians there were just phenomenal, these phenomenal jazz musicians and classical musicians. I um, mean, just, um, you know, just the absolute top level of musicianship. And here I was this, you know, sort of half baked, uh, guy that had been wandering around, uh, um, uh, playing my flute. <laughs> but, um, uh, as I was, as I had that experience, one of the things that was pivotal for me there, apart from the musical aspect was that, uh, once I got into it and really started to learn and, and to grow musically, um, I uh, realized as I was talking to people that everybody felt the same way I did. Everybody felt overwhelmed by all the people around me and, and, and them and thinking, how could I ever play as good as that guy or that woman? You know, it was, it was, uh, so I, I realized just, just focus on my own thing on doing it. And, uh, stop wondering what I was doing there and being grateful and appreciative that I was there, uh, among all those, uh, wonderful teachers and, uh, and students. And so, um, I, I, uh, got into it, um, because the, the, the curriculum was really based on ear training, uh, and we had to sing. There was no way out of it. Uh, and I mean, I even tried to ask, you know, do I have to sing? <laughs> yes, you have to sing. And, uh, so, um, uh, luckily I didn't lose my voice anymore and I started singing and I actually started to enjoy it. Uh, and, uh, I realized that one of the things that we did in the beginning, we were given a tape of all these different melodies and they were from different, there was quite a few jazz things in there, but there was also some Ladino music, some medieval Jewish music from Spain. Uh, there was some um, Hindu music in there. There was all these different melodies, and each one of them had these little twists where it's like if you got off by a half step at a certain place, there might be a modulation here or something where you could really tell if you, if you had it and you didn't. And uh, intensely listening and trying to sing those melodies, I started to really hone in on my ear and realize why certain things were so difficult for me. The other thing is I, I took on, uh, I, I was doing a lot of jazz and improvisation when I was there. Uh, but I also, I also took on the, um, the, uh, study of klezmer music. And, uh, I had these cassettes that a friend had given me and they were uh, there was one particular piece. It was originally made on a wire uh, recorder uh, uh, or a wax cylinder, like back in 1905, uh, of Belf's Romanian Orchestra. And this one particular piece, and we was listening to it, and my teacher, Hankus, said, oh, that's, that's the one you're going to do. And so I started um, listening to this thing, and it's like you're listening through all this static and all this time, and... I realized how I could, with my imagination, I could fill in the blanks. I could fill in what the instruments really sounded like. And the more I listened, I started hearing, going back in time and hearing that moment in time. Uh, and it was, I think it was the exercise of my musical imagination uh, to fill in the blanks 
that help me become more active with my ear. And this is an idea I'm just coming to right now, Christopher. So, <laughs> um, um, but it was that, that, um, you know, it wasn't this great stereo system where all the sound and audio was perfect. It was so distant that I had to be really active uh, with my mind uh, uh, rather than uh, passively just taking it in. And I think that was a, a, a that really developed my, uh, my ear tremendously, that exercise. That's so interesting. You know, I, I think we've touched several times on the podcast previously and Obviously, it's a big part of what we teach at Musical U that, you know, ear training and singing and musical imagination or audiation are all really inseparable and intertwined. It's one of my big regrets or guilts, I suppose, when I think back to (laughs) one of the first things we made was our relative pitch app for ear training for doing interval recognition. Yes. And it's a good app. It's a popular app. It really helps people get the hang of recognizing intervals. But there is almost no audiation and there is no singing in it. And when I look at it, I just think that that's just not the right way to do it. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, that's why at Musical U we've really built it out and, you know, integrated it into something that is much more cohesive and holistic. Um, but it's fascinating to hear that for you, there was that really pivotal experience of kind of going deep with your musical imagination and connecting it with your ear and, and finally tapping into that singing voice as a tool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another big thing at the conservatory was, was uh, the community uh, having fellow students to play ear training games with was is so much more fun than doing it by yourself. <laughs> um, and sometimes, you know, I mean, you do, it, now we didn't have any of the apps and any of the recordings and any of that kind of stuff back then. So it was like, you know, I'm going to sit down at a piano, I'm going to play a note and try and sing an interval and I'm in a practice room and with, with, you know, three other people playing around me. It's like, it was, uh, it took a lot of focus, but now with, with, I mean, I can imagine with apps and things like that, makes it so much easier but back then um you know so but also having the community having the support of everybody and um you know i remember one time uh going to um they had fantastic concerts there all the time and jordan hall the um the musical hall there is this amazing super vibey place um acoustically amazing and just old and 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 has so many, um, you know, atomic memories there of all the music that's been played there. Uh, and we went to a, a uh, it was a jazz, I think it was Danilo Perez, um, and uh, who was also a teacher there. And we went to the thing, and it was after the um, after the show. And there was one line I remember, and I was just kind of singing it, you know, but you know, but I don't do, but something like that some little bebop jazz line. And my friend turns to me, he's like, man, you can remember that? You've got a great ear. And I was like, oh gosh, I guess <laughs> I do. <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, other experiences there um, were, uh, I, we also did a lot of chord ear training and a lot of harmonic ear training. And that's what I really learned about harmony. Um, but um, at the time, I was really focusing on playing the flute. So um, while you, um, of course, harmony is really important for playing, and I played jazz and I did some jazz training there, um, and I knew what things were. I finally understood the theory of chords and the theory of stuff, and I did a lot of ear training with them. But it didn't really sink in uh, until later on. Uh, I guess we'll get into this later, but later on, I started really playing piano a lot more. Uh, So just using it, using what you're doing in your, uh, it is so important, like to actually actively use it. Um, uh, So I was still, uh, I was still very, very focused on melody and I'm very grateful for that. Um, The klezmer music that I'm playing, that I was playing is um, the melody is absolutely the, what it's all about. And to, have a deep understanding of the phrasing and the melody and the language to really make it come alive. I, I had to, um, because the flute was not a, um, a contemporary instrument in klezmer music. It had been, uh, you know, a century before, but there was not many recordings of it. And, um, 
Most people were playing clarinets and violins. I listened to a lot of clarinet and violin and tried to imitate those sounds on my flute. I discovered new techniques, I, a, a, a much deeper connection with my instrument because I had to create techniques. No one could tell me what they were with my breathing and my articulation. You know, like when you play a uh, klezmer piece, like this is, the, this is that one I was talking about, the first one that I learned. If I would write the music down, it would, it would it, and just play it from written music, it would sound like this. Okay, but if I play it with all the klezmer language and ornaments, it's going to sound more like this. You know, there's just so much, there was so much for me to learn and figure out in um, playing that. Wonderful. And did that come before, after, or during your time sat on a rock with your Native American flute, imitating the sounds of nature? Before. So mm. all this, all this um, experience played into my Native American flute experience later, later on. So here I'm at the conservatory. I don't have Native American flute yet. Um, and I'm playing uh, and get, starting my intense uh, obsession with klezmer music while at the still time learning some jazz um, and, uh, and free improvisation and things like that. Um, while we're at the conservatory, the other really important formative thing there was my studies with uh, George Russell and the Lydian chromatic concept. Um, again, I was a, I was a melody person and harmony was still a puzzle to me, but he showed how, uh, me, how, um, chords grew out of scales, how they grew out of the inner gravitational tonal fields of a scale and how the dynamics of pitches working together, uh, how they, um, how the, the, his concept of tonal gravity was, a, a real, groundbreaker for me because I could see how one note relates to another and, and has these subtle pulls and gravitational uh, things in a more um, uh, colored and nuanced way across the whole spectrum of the, uh, of the circle of fifths. And uh, that had a profound effect on, on my uh, musicality from that moment on, and in my ears as well. Mm, well, I think we'll have to invite you back onto the podcast to go deep on that one of these days, because I think there's a lot to unpack there and share with people. Very good. At this time, you were mostly playing flute, is that right? Or were you moving back to the piano at this stage? I was, at this time I was playing flute. And so what happened is after I, uh, after I, I had started teaching a few, I was going back and forth between Alaska and the conservatory. Like I do a semester or two and I take a break and then I go back. And when I was in Alaska, I had started teaching, um, uh, one of our friend's daughters, some beginning piano lessons. Uh, and then when I, uh, came back and, and I, and I graduated, I said, okay, I want to do lessons in a more earnest way. And I want some flute. I want to teach flute lessons. And there just wasn't that many students to have, but there were people looking for piano lessons. I said, well, I can teach beginning piano. You know, I still remember how to, how to do some of that stuff and I can teach beginning piano and then I'll move them on to another teacher. Uh, but I came to that with some of my ideas from the conservatory. Some of them were good. Some of them weren't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, um, uh, I, I, I had this, uh, um, you know, I, I, I had some ear training ideas that didn't really bowl over with five-year-olds. And, um, <laughs> um, uh, but, <laughs> but uh, a couple of things that I did have is I had this idea that I wanted my students to play the music that they wanted to play. Uh, so I was blessed with a, a family of uh, these two boys that were really uh, intense and really gifted. Uh, and this one boy, he was, you know, he's eight years old. And he said, I want to play Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. And I had this crazy idea that like, okay, we're not going to do an arrangement. We're going to do Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, the, the first movement. And um, we're just going to learn how Beethoven did it. 
I had never personally played it. So we took it out and we got into it and we figured it out. And uh, what was the coolest thing for me, experience, not only that he figured out and was he able to play it, um, even though his hands couldn't reach some of the stuff, he would, you know, make do with it and whatever, um, is that then one day after teaching it to him, I sat down and all of a sudden I could play it. I was like, you know, how could I play this thing? You know, how could I? And, and I realized um, what I could accomplish by teaching. And quickly, um, my piano studio grew quite a bit where, I mean, I had some flute students and some saxophone and, and, and all, all others, but the piano thing really started to take off. And I realized that I learned so much from teaching. The other thing I realized um, with piano teaching is that there's so much um, th- that I, I had learned about theory, but I had never applied it, learned it, how to apply it to the piano. And the missing link for me for, and for my students was the kinesthetic awareness where you play a chord and you can feel the shape of that chord in your hand. Now, this is something they teach guitar players all the time, but not something that is, uh, that is really big with piano. And I started to teach with that link, linking the ear, the kinesthetic thing of something, and the theory with what the music that people are actually doing. And it was, um, it was huge um, for me. I really started get, getting into teaching chords. And when I started teaching it and then playing it more myself on the piano, I started to understand it for myself in a much deeper way and, uh, and see where my students went with it. Mm, interesting. And let's get specific then. You know, can you give us a, a sense of what that meant you know, when you were sat down with your student in a lesson? What did it mean to help them understand the chords and have that relationship with the piano? Well, first of all, um, students, a lot of times they, they come in and they say, this is, I'm going to back up a little bit to approach this. People come to a lesson and uh, I ask them, okay, what do you want to learn with piano? I say, well, I want to learn the basics. And the truth is nobody wants to learn the basics of piano. <laughs> they want to play a song. You want to play something, okay? So what do you, what's the song you want to play? So I have this little thing that I do. I say, I wave my magic pencil, and all of a sudden you can do anything you want on the piano. What is the thing you mostly want to do, okay? So uh, they don't say, I want to play the basics. They say, well, I want to play this song, or I want to play that song. And a lot of times it's not a classical song, or it might be, you know, like I might say, I want to play for Elise, or I want to play, uh, you know, this pop song. I want to play Adele or I want to play this uh, thing. And so what I found is that, okay, what's the fastest road? A lot of times to learning a lot of pop songs is learning chords because they don't want even, they might want to play the little piano ref, but they also, a lot of times they want to sing. They want to sing and play. So um, it's a lot of times teaching people the chords and I have this thing that I do where I teach, you know, in, in, in the first lesson, you can learn half of all the major and minor chords. Uh, and that's like starting from scratch, knowing no piano at all. And then this, the second lesson, you could be playing a song with them. Uh, and, it, you know, so it gets people going. I mean, I had this, this, this drive to get people playing the music they want to play right off. Because for me, growing up, it was always... You had to jump through this hoop and that hoop and this hoop and that hoop. And then maybe someday way down the line, you, you got to play the music you wanted to play. And um, so I want my students to be playing from day one, playing something that they want to play. And uh, there's ways to do that. Um, and I figured out through um, that was a big deal through the different ways, shortcuts to being able to see the chords and the biggest thing is because music is one big pattern. Uh, and, I, and, you know, the theory I learned is so important. Many people think about music theory like it's some, like, really difficult thing. But it all comes from one thing. It all comes from one vibration uh, and branches out from there. So if you, see a, if you learn a pattern, rather than learning a chord, 
like, like rather than, okay, we're going to learn the C major chord. We're going to learn the D major chord. Okay, now we're going to learn this. Rather than learning that, we're going to learn two patterns that you can use to play all the major chords that, that uh, to play the six major chords right now. Just two patterns, and you can play them all. That's the kind of thing that I developed as I was teaching and learned and teaching myself at the same time. Uh, so at the same time, I'm getting more and more into playing piano uh, and my abilities are improving. And because I was focusing on these directions, my sight reading improved magically too. Um, I was able to read music a lot better because I understood it. I really understood what it felt like with my hands, what it sounded like with my ears and how to teach it to somebody. Wow. And do you think there were any particular mental models or frameworks that led to you being able to teach it in that way? Or was it a culmination of everything you had learned up until that point? Um, the basic principle was to keep things simple, make it as simple as possible. And following that principle, that e evolved everything. So when I looked at, at a student and I could see them struggling with something. What is holding them up? And when you're teaching, you learn that every student is different. They pack things differently. So someone can learn a skill that is, you know, that, that takes a whole bunch of smaller skills. They can learn it all at once. And someone, you have to unpack that skill and unpack it, getting down to real basic level and figure out what all the components are. So here we're going back to that, that class that I took, you know, poetry writing class, when you're looking at all the little details and how they add up to the whole, but it's the, really the whole, the picture, the, the single picture that guides it all. Um, it, it guides all the, the little details and w brings them all together. So we skimmed over something there, and I want to make sure we just briefly do it justice, because <laughs> you mentioned an obsession with klezmer music, but I think by the way yes. we've just discussed things, people might think, you know, you dabbled and then we moved on, but that was a, a pretty intense focus for you, wasn't it? It was, and it was a, 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 a huge focus for me in, in my life, where at first, you know, I was very attracted to it, I was very emotionally attracted to it, and my first... Um, thing with it, it was uh, that I, um, I had this idea that I was bringing back, helping to bring back this lost culture because klezmer music had sort of died off and it was being revived at that time. And it was the culture of my grandparents uh, or my grandparents would have had when they were young. Um, and uh, bringing back things that had been lost in a sense. But uh, it became more personal to me in terms of my own expression, expressing my own, uh, my own feelings and my own, uh, my own spirit. And, uh, in the process, uh, you know, I, 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 mean, I was playing it a lot. I was teaching it a lot. Um, I taught at Klez camp and I taught in a lot of different large groups and, um, and I, um, and plus the band I put together in Alaska, basically I was the expert. So I was teaching the other people to, to play it and to have this stylistic stuff with it. Um, and I was performing it a lot. So I was doing uh, gigs and weddings and, and things like that. And it naturally drew me closer to the Jewish community in Alaska and to rediscovering things and discovering things that I didn't know about the Jewish religion. So at first it was a cultural thing, bringing back a Jewish culture. And then I started to understand the, the spiritual uh, ideas behind the, uh, behind the music. Uh, and I started to learn more about the spirituality that I hadn't been taught when I was younger, the deeper spirituality of, of Judaism, not just all the trappings of all the customs and culture, but the spiritual aspects. Uh, and I was uh, writing quite a bit, too. Uh, there's one, one piece in where I wrote... Um, there's a note on the flute, uh, a C sharp, which is really difficult to play in tune, and we're always fighting with it. And so I wrote this, uh, and it reminded me of, of what it's like to be human, where you're like here between heaven and earth, you're, you've got this real flexible thing where you can choose one thing or another, and we bumble around, we make all these 
uh, uh, mistakes and we have all this learning. Uh, and so I made that note, the center of this, uh, the, 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 the uh, kind of the center of this melody. It's called uh, Between Heaven and Earth. It goes down like that, but I keep on going that, that C sharp. Um, and, and the music started to become more personal to me. Uh, and, and I also started to really be attracted to understanding my own spirituality in a deeper way uh, in that, throughout that whole journey. Um, musically, also focusing so intensely on this, kind, on this one style of music all the different details, listening so deeply to these old recordings for a period of 15 years, and then writing and creating my own music, uh, practicing for hours and hours and hours to get things just right, um, recording. So I did uh, two recordings, uh, or three, record, three albums of this kind of music. Um, and I, it was... Uh, and and what it developed in me as a musician and on my instrument and my and with my phrasing, um, it it was a, a tremendous experience to focus so intensely on one particular genre uh, for this period of time. Mm, and you had had already such a rich variety of musical experiences, instruments, genres, cultures, collaborations. Was, you know, was this the moment where you felt like, ah, I found it, I'm a real musician now, or did it come earlier? Or uh, was there any point where you were like, aha, I've got it? <laughs> um, well, uh, there's, uh, there's different moments that I've, I've had. And um, normally I'm just so busy thinking about it and... Um, that I don't take time to reflect on that. And uh, um, in a, another interview I did a while back, I think the, the moment, one of the moments more recently where I felt like, oh gosh, I really have this, is I was teaching a lesson uh, and uh, my student asked me to play something for her. And she goes, she said, how do you do that? And I was playing something on the piano, just some chords. And uh, she said, how do you do that? And it's like, how, do what? I, you know, I, I showed her what I was doing. It's like, no, how do you make it so emotional? And it's like, okay, that's, I really felt like that was the moment where I had it. When I had, it's like, what, you know, when you're around musicians and like, you might know some person and all of a sudden they start playing music. And it's like, wow, where did that guy come from? It's this magical quality where there's so much depth and richness to that expression. And I, felt that, um, you know, that someone had recognized that magic in me, uh, that I had expressed with that kind of depth and richness, uh, to my expression. And I think my experience with klezmer music and putting that energy and that time and that effort and definitely my, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 hours, <laughs> um, uh, really, um, brought that to the, uh, it brought it out in a way where now I'm able to access it in all the music that I do. Um, because when I, when I branched out spiritually, uh, I also, from there, I also began to return to other forms of music, uh, to jazz and other thing, types of music. Um, and now it's like, whenever I sit down and play music, I, there is something I know that I, I, I have this kind of feeling and intention uh, behind what I'm doing. And it's, it's interesting because it, it happens whether I'm playing an instrument that I'm very experienced at and that know very deeply, or whether I'm first starting out on an instrument that I don't know very well um, and, or that I have more limitations on, I still know how to access the, um, the feeling of what I want to express and bring it out from, my, from inside. 
Amazing. I, I think that may be one of my favorite statements of any podcast episode so far, because in a nutshell, <laughs> I think you've just described having an instinct for music. But it's clear to anyone listening at this point that this was something that came from study and learning and practicing and exploring music. And you you built that instinct and you created it in yourself. Absolutely. You know, and, you know, one of the one of the things, uh, the pivotal things I realized, uh, I remember when I was when I was living in Italy. And. Uh, when you're you know, I was in a culture that was so old and, you know, coming from America where everything's new and, and, and it's, it's really different being in a European culture where everything is old. And even though I could speak very fluently within 30 seconds to 90 seconds of me speaking, people knew this guy isn't from around here. And then as soon as they knew that I was from someplace else, I could feel this click of separation. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, ill-intended. It's just that there was, I was not part of that, uh, you know, 3,000-year-old culture. And so I had a real drive. I wanted to be really good at speaking Italian so I could extend those 30 seconds to maybe five or six minutes <laughs> before someone, you know, busted me. And, uh, and one of the things is I couldn't roll my R's. And I remember sitting on, uh, on a bus, I had this bus ride to this class I was taking and trying to roll my hours, like, duh, 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 you know, trying to, and I taught myself to roll my hours. I, I could do this, you know, when I was in my twenties, I was an adult. I could finally go. Rrr, rrr. And I was like, I realized at that moment that I could, that was like with practice, I could do anything I want. <laughs> if I could teach my body to do something that it couldn't do before, then with practice, I can do it. So now I, there's never an excuse anymore. <laughs> Perfect. So I, I'm sure it won't come as a surprise to anyone listening to learn that you are still exploring new genres and developing a wide range of musical projects. Tell us what you're up to these days. Well, these days, um, the, um, the biggest thing that's, that we're really into is mariachi music. Uh, and it's interesting because I, I got on this website. I want to do more performing. I have you know, been teaching for a really long time and wanting to do more performing. And I got on this website called Gig Salad. And I noticed a lot of people were looking for mariachi bands. And so I said, well, you know, I'm going to see if I can find a mariachi band and see if I can help them out. Uh, and I looked all over. I tried to book gigs for other bands. didn't work out. And so finally I said, okay, you know, I'm going to do this, you know, and I had this colleague who said that she wanted to sing a song, but then I asked, I said, I asked my wife, will you sing this song? And she was amazing. I mean, she's a great singer, <laughs> but she, she just took to this stuff like, like a fish to water. And so we started to, we put together a mariachi band and like anything in my life, uh, I had no clue how much work I was getting in myself into, uh, in terms of learning myself and then gathering together, uh, a group of musicians to play. And so for the past, uh, um, coming up on two years now, we ha uh, we've been, um, we've been really just getting into mariachi and exploring it and playing it. I started learning the guitarron, um, and uh, mostly I'm playing, for mariachi music, I'm playing the accordion. Uh, so another new learning for me there is that uh, it's real difficult to get together a, 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 a big band of people to play something, to get all these musicians who are very busy together. So I started figuring out how I could play the bass part and the rhythm part with my left hand and then play the violins and trumpets with my right hand. So I'm learning all this about things that I can do with the, with the accordion to make a full sound so we can actually perform as a duo or as a trio um, with guitar or violin. And so, um, I don't know, it's just been, it's been a blast. And it's the wonderful thing is to doing things together with my wife and uh, making music together. Uh, that's the best part of all. Fantastic. Well, we'll definitely have a link to that band, Mariachi Flor de Missouri. 
and your Heart Wins project that I believe encompasses other performing groups too. Is that right? Yes. With th- with that, I'm doing uh, other world music. So, um, uh, for example, um, Rachel and I just went down to Arkansas and we taught a school uh, workshop on Cuban rhythms. I've got some uh, another world music library presentation coming up. So doing a lot of edutainment on world music, which is something I taught uh, in the university for, uh, I don't know, 11, 12 years, I taught world music classes. So taking that knowledge and spreading it out, I've also done workshops on Irish music and just different things that I've studied and been into over the years uh, and spreading it out and uh, playing with other people. Wonderful. Well, Andrew, it has been such a pleasure to get to talk to you. I already knew you, obviously, through our work together, (laughs) but this chance to go deep into your story and share some of your insights and wisdom with our podcast listeners has just been a delight. So thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Well, thank you. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, oh, wow, look at that clock. We went on for a while, didn't we? (laughs) (laughs) It didn't feel Um, like it. You know, All right. Well, thank you so much, Christopher. And it's been a real pleasure. Want to know how musical you are and how to improve? Find out free at musicalitypodcast.com slash checklist. Wow. That was definitely our longest interview on the show so far. But I wasn't surprised since I knew going in just how rich and varied and fascinating a musical story Andrew has. It's like he's managed to pack about two or three lifetimes worth of music careers into one. I'm going to do my best to summarize and pull out the most interesting bits for you, but if I miss anything important, or there's anything that really resonated with you, I'm sure Andrew would love to hear from you directly. You can reach out at musicalitypodcast.com slash contact. Andrew has had a phenomenally interesting and successful career as a musician and music educator, but you might not have guessed it based on his early music experiences. With vocal nodules that prevented him from singing a piano learning experience that made him feel more like he was memorizing tricks to perform than really becoming a musician, and getting sent to his room to stay there until he could produce a sound from his flute. It's fair to say Andrew was not the child prodigy that his later career might lead you to believe. Still, it's clear that Andrew loved music from the beginning, enjoying the rich musical environment at home, banging on his family's baby grand piano, and exploring different genres through records. Flute became his main instrument, and the cultural assumption that girls play flute prompted him to seek out male flute players and discover new genres and explore music from all around the world. Although he didn't study music at university, it was interesting to hear how his studies there, particularly a course on poetry, equipped him with a detail-oriented analytical skill set that he said he later brought to many activities in his musical life and teaching. After university, he supported himself living in Italy through busking on the street, developing his ability to improvise and play by ear, and finding to his delight that as long as he could play, he could eat. A collaboration with a reggae bassist inspired him to want to play more reggae, and although flute isn't the most common instrument in that genre, he was able to dive into the burgeoning Cleveland reggae scene and join a new band, Sata, a dynamic and diverse group of musicians, almost the polar opposite of the academic world he had found too stifling. He went on to tour the world with the band, taking up saxophone and percussion and playing keyboard again, as well as the flute. One pivotal experience during that time was an encounter with Crazy Coyote, a mountain man in Utah who introduced him to the Native American flute. Andrew formed a bond with the instrument, and almost 20 years later would be given one as a gift, learn to play it by letting the instrument teach him, as he put it, and formulate his unique approach of improvisational playing in a book for Mel Bay titled How to Sit on a Rock. It was great to hear more about the origins of how Andrew thinks about improvisation, because that's been a big part of how we've managed to combine the best of both worlds at Musical U the free, creative spirit of improvisation, which is fun but can feel like a bit of a wilderness and be hard to improve in, and the strict, rule-based approach, which makes it easy to learn but is ultimately very limiting. There is a middle ground which lets you learn it step by step without limiting your creativity, 
and Andrew's ideas developed while sometimes literally sitting on a rock have formed a big part of how we teach this to our members at Musical U. After four years of touring with the reggae band Sata, Andrew was conscious of his desire for more formal music education. He'd found it frustrating not being able to communicate his musical ideas, and he found his way to the New England Conservatory. There he studied in the Third Stream program, set up to intermingle the worlds of classical and jazz music. Studying under George Russell, he discovered the Lydian chromatic concept, which gave him a new understanding of scales and harmony, influencing both his melody playing on flute and later his piano teaching too. From the background Andrew had had before the conservatory, and the fact that the master's program he did was specifically about exploring and combining a variety of musical styles, it would be easy to assume he would go on to explore lots of different things after leaving the conservatory. But in fact, he connected deeply with the traditional Jewish style of music called klezmer, and spent 15 years really devoting himself to studying it, performing it, composing it, and pioneering lots of new technique required to bring the flute back into the tradition of klezmer music. It was great to hear Andrew's demonstrations, both of the musical flourishes characteristic of klezmer, and one of his own compositions, a spiritually inspired piece between heaven and earth. After going wide across instruments and styles, he went deep into klezmer, and eventually emerged again, going wide through his piano teaching and performing with other groups. It was fascinating to hear how he found a different relationship with the piano and his own way of teaching his students, taking advantage of the kinesthetic, the feel of notes and chords under your fingers, as well as a more ear-led approach, tailored to each student's particular needs and interests, and finding ways to equip them with a versatile and creative understanding of their instrument. There was one observation Andrew made about his time at the New England Conservatory, that when he arrived he felt really out of place among all the amazing musicians, but gradually realized that everyone there was intimidated by everyone else. This is a really big theme to Andrew's story, I think, that things which from the outside seem effortless and inspiring and intimidating actually have taken the musician a lot of thought, practice, and personal development to achieve. Even when I asked Andrew about whether he felt he'd made it as a musician, his hesitation and eventual answer made clear what he had said at the beginning, that learning music is a journey without an end, and he feels he is continually learning and improving. At the same time, though, it's clear that from the outside anyone would consider him to be a very capable, accomplished, and impressive musician. We often talk here on the podcast about talent in music, and I always love to unpack the true story behind musicians you might assume just had a natural gift. Andrew's story is a beautiful example of this, and I absolutely loved his description towards the end of our conversation about tapping into the magic of music making. How after the years and decades of learning and exploring and performing and creating music, he feels like he's internalized that sense of what to play and how. And it's not about mastery of a specific instrument or genre, though he did say that going so deep into klezmer music on flute probably played a part. It's about developing what I think we can safely call the instinct for music, something that society tells us we must be born with. But as Andrew's example, along with countless other guests on this show before, demonstrate, it is absolutely a learnable skill. As you'd probably expect given his journey, Andrew is still busy in a variety of musical projects, and although we're fortunate enough to have him as part of our team at Musical U, he's also playing regularly with his mariachi group, Mariachi Flor de Missouri, other world music groups under the banner name Heartwinds, and he teaches both in person and online. We'll have links to all those projects, as well as Andrew's own website where you can inquire about lessons if you're interested, in the show notes for this episode at musicalitypodcast.com. I have loved getting to know Andrew over the last couple of years, but as you can probably tell from this conversation, he's a man who has an endless supply of experience, stories, and wisdom to share, so I really enjoyed having this opportunity to learn more about his story, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thanks for joining me for this episode. Stay tuned for our next one, where I'm going to invite Andrew to come back and share a little bit about that Lydian chromatic concept he mentioned, and what gravity has to do with understanding music by ear. 
Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in